somebody tell them God is a healer. If you ask him to heal. No, wait a minute, wait a minute. God is a healer if you ask him to heal. Come on, God will give peace if you ask him for peace. Amen. Come on, put it out there. Let God take care of some things. Amen. Amen. He says you have not because you ask not. Right? You have not because you ask not. Reach out there and grab that thing. That's what it's out there for. Come on, I don't feel bad about grabbing them samples. That's what they're out there for. Come on, that's why God put it out there. He said he knew you would need it. Amen. Come on, now, why did he say he was sent a comforter? Because he knew the road would get a little bumpy and rough in these last days. Amen. He said, I'm going to send you a comforter. Amen. That's what God wants to do for us. Amen. I'm thankful that he's here this morning. Amen. I'm thankful my buddy Chris wrote over where he's at, but he got me a big old thing of, uh, of hot sauce and a barbecue brush. I'm like, God, didn't know. I'm going to give that guy a hug. He don't even know. I'm like, all right. Amen. He knows right up my aisle. I'm going to tell you, last year, I didn't even win the basket. There was a basket auctioned off a barbecue ba basket. It got up above my price range. Somebody bought it, and guess what? They turned around and gave it to me. And out of that basket, it was a barbecue basket. And I still I found one of the best books I've ever found on barbecue inside of that thing, all right? Amen? So I'm, I'm thankful for all my barbecue and stuff and all that. Come over, and I'll let you enjoy it, too. There's some food on the table, all right? All right. Amen. I'm thankful yesterday that, uh, first off, I, I, you haven't gotten to see it yet next Sunday. Uh, you won't want to miss it. I know that our young people and, uh, and, and, and all, all around, all, there's been a lot of guys involved all the way around. The men have to help put it together. There's going to be a uh, thing for our Easter, a special thing that they've done, kind of a neat effect, something I've never seen done before. And I know they have put, I'm not kidding you, they put a lot of time in it. Yesterday, I mean hours. I'm not just, like yesterday, they're hours. They've been through this thing. So I know it's going to go off without a hitch. I believe that. I believe it's going to be awesome and anointed what God is going to do it because of the effort. Amen. No matter what you do, if you put God in it, God's anointing will make it a blessing. Oh, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you're not expecting, that's what you're going to receive. I believe that God's going to work in it. Amen. What else was I going to tell you? I had to thank you guys for yesterday, everybody that was able to come out and help out. And I know that not everybody was able to make it out, but hey, listen, uh, if you're here. This is a beautiful church that God has given us a beautiful day. Even if, even if you aren't able to be here, can we just give a hand clap of praise to the Lord for those souls? Amen. Leading on the inside, people think they get down the lights, uh, all the, all that jazz and getting it all done. You guys have done a fantastic job. I'm thankful for that. Uh, thankful all this morning that we're able to be part of the leadership meeting. That was a true uh, blessing. Each one getting to grow in. I got some funny pictures I'll have to show you guys this morning. I can tell you for a certain that there are adults that play with Legos. I seen it. I seen it, Sister Bowers. I'm telling you, I don't. I, I'm, just, I'm telling you, I got pictures of it. Who said that was for kids? I don't know. Uh, I, after a little bit, I was thinking we need to call in the kids because they were having a hard time getting to figure it out. Amen. No, I'm just kidding. It was. It, it's all about growing. Amen. God has to settle things in, and what they learn is this: is because you get a box of Legos, it doesn't mean that it just puts itself together. It takes time. And sometimes people may look around and say, well, what's God doing? Listen, God's working piece by piece in people's lives. Amen? Piece by piece. God doesn't just take it. If he, if he wanted a perfect, he would have dropped it down here. If he wanted a thousand member church that covered six blocks, he would have dropped it right down here. He said, no, 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 because I need somebody to care for. Remember when he talked about the loss, he always talked about the seeker. And that's what he has to establish in us, that seeker's heart. Amen? That seeker, that ability, that accountability in him. So don't don't, don't get ask God to rush the process in your life. Sometimes you're going through it. It's because there's a process that God is wanting to work out. Amen? There's some things that God's wanting to work out in your life. So amen, I'm thankful for that. But let's get ready to get into the word today. How many people know what today is? Palm Sunday. Everybody go ahead and show me your palm. I was kidding. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It is a Palm Sunday because you'll be able to give your friend a high five in just a minute. Amen. I'm thankful for that. There was a boy one time that was at home sick, and he was always faithful to Sunday school. But this particular Sunday morning, he was feeling really rough. And, and mom came home, and he, he didn't know what to think. And he, she came home, and she was holding a palm frog. And so what in the world are you, what, what are you... Uh, Carrie, he said, she said, well, that's a palm frog. This is what they laid down whenever uh, Jesus began to walk through. He said, wouldn't you know it? The one Sunday I'm sick, that's the Sunday Jesus shows up. <laughs> Amen. I believe he's here all the time. Amen. Amen. I know we've heard that before. Let's stand and get ready to go into the word today. Amen. I simply, I don't plan to be long-winded. Amen. But I never do. Amen. <laughs> Lord bless it. Amen. I'm just glad to have wind. Amen. I'm glad that I'm shorter than uh, Paul on that. Amen. I just bring it as the Lord allowed, lays it on my heart. Amen. Luke chapter 19, verse 29. And uh, a little bit longer reading than I ordinarily would read altogether. But you know what? We're going to do it on this Palm Sunday. I've been praying about it 
uh, praying about the Palm Sunday. And, and, you know, really a lot of the things that they made out from the Palm Sunday, and there's a lot of paganistic things that come out of that. There really are uh, things that people have made it and what it's into. But amen. I, so I always sometimes I'm praying, like, Lord, why don't you put this on me heavy? Lord, why don't you just lay this on me? You know, and, and Lord, begin to open up and show me some things. And today I want to open up to you what the Lord allowed me to see uh, concerning uh, this this morning. Amen. Luke chapter 19 and verse 29. Amen. And we're going to read over, uh, we're going to read about 10 or 11 verses, but I'll read it quickly, I promise. As long as you guys promise to follow along, I'll read it fairly quickly. And it came to pass when he was come nigh to Bethany, and the Bethany, and the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, in the which at your entering ye shall find a colt tied, whereon yet never man set. Loose him and bring him hither. Amen. And, and according to where you go in the parallel of the scripture, these stories, uh, you'll see just a little bit different verbiage. But anyway, let's continue on. Verse 31. And if any man ask you, why do you loose him? Thus, say, uh, uh, thus shall ye say unto him, because the Lord hath need of him. Amen. And verse 32. And they that were sent went their way and found even as he had said unto them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto them, Why loose ye the colt? In verse 34. And they said, The Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garment upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. Amen? And again, reading in the parallel, you see the things. Uh, anyway, verse 37. And when he was come nigh, now, even now, at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. Let's say that again. And let, let's read that verse again. And when, they would, he, and when he was come nigh... Even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples begin to what? Rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. And we got three more verses saying, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. Now they commanded him. And here's what he said. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Amen. Let's pray over this word today. Amen. Let's just pray with an open mind and open heart. I know we've heard uh, Palm Sunday messages before, and, but uh, let's just open our mind and our heart today to this word. Heavenly Father, I come that you would speak to me today, God. I'm praying, Lord, that every soul in here, God, that you would speak to us, God. I, I can't attest their word, but hear their prayers right now, God, as they call out to you. Lord, I'm praying in myself. Lord, let these words be settled in my bones. God, let these lips of clay be anointed to be a mouthpiece today for you, Lord. Let every spirit spiritual ear receive this today. Those that may not be able to hear in their spiritual ears, Lord, I pray that there is an opening and a shaking in the spirit this morning, God, that we would receive fully what you have for us on this Sunday. God, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for this word, and we ask that you bless it in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. 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 Look at somebody and ask them this. What does Jesus see? What does Jesus see? And you may be seen. Amen, 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 amen. This morning, it, it's a very familiar passage of Scripture, and probably there are many pulpits that will be hearing words and talking about Palm Sunday, Palm Sunday. But today, I, I want to start off just with that in mind, but I really want to bring us to a thing. When, whenever you think about Christ, what do you think about? When you think about Jesus walking in the New Testament, what are the things that come to mind? And I'm asking you guys this morning for your input. What are the things that you think of when you think of Jesus? Love. Love, all right. What do you think when you open up Matthew through Mark, Luke, and John? What do you see, Brother Bird? Forgiveness. Forgiveness, all right. Amen. What else? Miracles, Miracles. all right. And yeses, amen. Suffering. What is it? Suffering. Suffering, all right. There was suffering, all right. What else? What are some things that you think of when you think about Jesus in the New Testament? Anybody else? What, what about some of the healings, the miracles that took place that were said? What about the blinded eyes? Amen? What about Christ being the deliverer of those? Amen? Whenever they were persecuted. What about Christ being the peace and the strength for, uh, for Stephen as he was stoned? What about 
the peace that he gave them? What about the confidence that was put into the disciples, though the early church members, people just like us? Look at somebody say, just like you. Just like you. What about the confidence and the boldness and the things that he put in them? This is what my mind thinks about this morning. What what do I think about when I think about Jesus? Whenever, if I said this this morning, what would come to your mind? Sister Powers, what would you think if I said to you this morning, Jesus is coming back? What would you say? What comes to your mind this morning if I say that to you? The King is coming. The King is coming. All right. Amen. Come on. Let's give you praise of that. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Freedom. Freedom. All right. Come on. The king's coming. We got freedom. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Sister or Sister Mary? He was without sin. Without sin. All right. Come on. Let's thank him for that. Thank you, Lord. That's what allows us that freedom. Sister Paulette? Jesus come back soon. All right. He's coming back soon. Amen. Amen. All right. Jocelyn? That's all right. All right. You heard the prayers, right? That's what she said. Helping her in her prayers. All right. All right. What, what do you think about whenever I say that? That Jesus is coming back. Brother Mike? Like your big brother's coming home to fix things. Oh, big brother's coming home to fix things. All right. Come on. What else, what else do you think? Rejoicing. Peace, no battles. Dad's coming home from the army. All right. All right. Come on. What else do you think? Brother Troy? No more sorrow. Sister Davis? Coming home for me. Come, oh, coming home for you? Who else had their hand up? Somebody in the back. Oh, Sister Marguerite? Yeah, we're going to live with him forever. All right, we're going to live for him forever? Going home. Going home? All right, all right. Hey, Amen. there's not a wrong answer in that. When we look at this, we think about, wow, that Jesus is coming back. You know, when God shows up, things change. Amen? Amen. Amen. Come on, when God shows up, things change in your situation. Amen? Amen. So I ask you today, what do you think about whenever you see him coming back? Uh, but what if we already knew that God was already there? Sometimes we look at God and we're like, oh, it's kind of like in a baseball game. We're like, oh, here comes the big hitter. Come on, things are about ready to turn. Oh, yeah, we're about ready to turn this game around. Come on, I've been in a few baseball games. We're out now counting ready. We've got three people on base, one hitter. Come on, you've got to knock it out of the park, man. And sometimes we get in situations in life where we're looking and we're saying, God, I need you to show up. I need you to come back in this situation. God, I need you to move in this situation. God, I need you to work. God, I need some kind of relief. Come on, I know I've been there where I prayed out of prayer. God, you, I, I need your relief. God, I need your hand. God, I need your help in this situation. And so when we look at this, we see what was going on in the early church. The early church was going through, and, and they weren't even fully developed yet, but there was some persecution taking place already. There were some people that after Jesus raised up Lazarus, they said, wait a minute, this guy is doing some crazy stuff. And the Pharisees said, he's messing things up for us. Man, we got to get this dude out of here. And then the people that were following Christ began to see some problems. They, they began to see some trials and tribulations. Why? Because they stood for the Lord. What happens in the Old Testament? When people would try to stand for righteousness or what God said, there would be battles that would come and there would be trials and afflictions that would come their way. Amen. So when we open up today, we see the people that are hungry for a move of God. Amen. They're hungry for his miracles. They're hungry for him. They, they've seen him work in the miracles, but they're ready for him to come in and, and, and change some things up. Amen. Directly after we read this portion of the scripture, we see where he goes in there and flips over the tables inside the sanctuary and uh, uh, he, he, or inside of the tabernacle. He goes in there, man. He flips them over and he, he says, hey, get the money changers out of here. We're waiting on him to come in and turn over some tables in our life. Amen? Right, 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 right. Many times we wait on God to move in our life in this situation. So we see where Jesus is out in a place. And, and finally we come to the spot in, in, in our scripture text where we see him walking along. And, and, and he comes up to a place and he stops and he speaks to a couple of his disciples. And he said, hey. Listen, I got a place I want you to go. When you go there, there's going to be a donkey and a colt. They're tied. I want you to come and bring them to me. If somebody asks you why, you just tell them that I need it. Now, what's interesting about this when you look at this, that only in the scripture, you, you never hear of Jesus calling for something to ride other than here. You don't see it. Everywhere he went, he walked. He, he rode on a boat a couple times, but you don't ever hear about him calling for something to ride. You don't. This was a pretty 
everything seen when you begin to put it in the scale of everything that was going on. Whenever Jesus was calling for the king, it was because he was about ready to make a statement. Amen. He could have walked in there, Brother Bird, and walked right where he needed to be. But this time, whenever he come in, he was coming in to make a statement. Amen. He was going to ride into the town. And, and what was the significance of him riding into town on, on, the, on, the, on the donkey? What was the significance of him coming in? Because you begin to see that in the scripture, or in, in the scripture, or even history tells you that whenever a leader would ride in, that the king would ride in in that fashion. He would be the one riding into the crowd, and there would be a, a procession. And so when the people begin to see it, they say, Oh, our king is coming there. Our king is, is, is coming along. But what was significant about the choice of animals that he would choose to ride? What is it? Humility, but what was significant? Now, in that time when a king or a leader would come in from a big battle victory, what would they do? They would come riding in on a big strong stallion and, and they would be very gallantly. But Jesus, now, here, here the church is being persecuted and all these problems are, are coming against the church. People are facing everything. But now Jesus comes riding in. And if you look at the different parallels of it, one will say the ass and, and the colt, and one will just say just the colt. But if you read along, you find that it was prophesied in the Old Testament, Zechariah, I believe. It was seven, uh, uh, nine and nine, I believe it was seven to seven or nine or nine. My mind switched up. Anyway, you see where it was prophesied that he would come riding in. But here's what happened he come riding in on a donkey or colt. Why would he ride in on a donkey or colt? Because that was the significance of riding in in peace. Now, here their king comes riding in and on this on this donkey, we understand, or colt, how, and, and he rides in, as, as he rides in, he rides in in a fashion of, of a king, first of all, so there are people that are standing on the outside saying, whoa, wait a minute, this is the carpenter. And not the carpenter down the road, isn't there were people that didn't accept him for who he was, so they see him and they say, wait a minute, why is the carpenter come riding in uh, uh, on, on this colt as if he's a king, as if he's, a, uh, as if he's somebody special? People begin to look at him and say, why is he doing this? Then there were people that looked him and thought, wait a minute, here he is thinking he's riding in here, acting like he's king. That's a mockery. There were people that were angry when Jesus began to, when he rode in down, down through the procession of the town on this particular Palm Sunday, as we would call it. Amen. There were people that got upset. There were people that, that seen him and some looked at him and they were rejoicing. They were exuberant. They were ecstatic, Sister Bird. They were all wound up and excited. You know why? Because they said, wow, we as a people finally have ourselves a flesh and blood king to sit on the throne and make some heads roll. We got a God that, that now he showed himself in flesh. And no longer will we be persecuted, Brother Barrett. No longer will the church have to suffer that. But we have a king that has risen up and is ready to fight and to bring this war against us. And sometimes we want that. Right, right, right. We want God to show up and make some heads roll. We want God to show up and turn some situations around. Amen? But we understand that that wasn't exactly what was going on. Then you see there were many people that were there in the crowd that, man, they, they said it was, a, I can imagine, a festive type crowd. People were excited. The word got out. There were people there that had been healed. What happens if you if you were healed by somebody, uh, somebody prayed for you and the Lord healed you through their prayers? You'd be excited to see that person. Like, wow, that's him. What that, man, that's him. Wow, they're excited. So this crowd was made up with an interesting group of people as Jesus began to make his way down. But here's what I want you to think about. There were many people there, that, but how did Jesus view them? How did Jesus look at the crowd when he came into town? How did Jesus see the, the crowd? We see how the crowd looked at him. Some were excited. Some were a little upset. Some were looking and saying, well, I don't know. And some were looking and saying, well, oh, yeah, I'm in, man, that's it. Right, this right, is the right. time that we have been waiting for. See, he rode into town. And as you read in the scripture, it, you know, let's go on over to uh, where we were at. Amen. And they, uh, let's see. Oh, here we go. Verse 37. Amen. Uh, John 19 and 37. And when he was coming to nigh, even now the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a with a mighty loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. Amen. When you read over in John, John's account of it in John 12, you find that it said that it was talking about the story of Lazarus was told. So guess what? Now you hear about this man. You need a healing in your body. Amen. How many can say, I need a healing in my body? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I said, he's showing up right here today. Amen. Amen. And Amen. everybody's going to say, oh, wow. Amen. And they're like, man, I'm telling you, this guy's real. Lazarus was dead, man. Right, right, Dude, right. that fellow was already stinking. Man, his body already had a stench right. to it. 
Man, this guy, I'm not kidding you. And he spoke, and that body come right outside of that tomb. And they're like, man, I'm going, dude. I'm excited. Oh, I got to see this, man. That's like getting tickets to the circus. You're like, man, I'm going to see what's going to happen. I've got, I've got to get there and see what's going on, man. So the crowd is exuberant. Why? Because all the mighty works that they had been, he had been doing were going around. In the crowd was probably, probably blind Bartimaeus. He was probably in the crowd. So, oh, hey, God, I want to tell you, man, I was blind, and now I can see because this dude. Come on, look at somebody say, I was blind, but now I can see. Come on, hey, 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 maybe you were blind, and now you can see, but maybe you were an addict, and now you're free. Can you tell somebody, I was an addict, and now I'm free? Come on, can you tell somebody, I, I was a gossip, but now I'm a truth speaker? Come on, I was a gossip, but now I'm a truth speaker? Can, can you look at somebody and, and, and tell them that, that I used to be depressed, but now I'm full of joy? Amen. Amen. I was depressed, but I'm full of joy, Sister Bowers. I want you to. Amen. And so, man, the crowd began to get excited because maybe the one thing didn't hit somebody, but the other thing did. What about Bartimaeus being there? What about Zacchaeus, who turned his whole life around? His family found salvation because, man, he had an encounter with Jesus coming down from that tree, and he went down the road. And Zacchaeus said, guys, I want to tell you, man, I know you didn't like me, but you remember when I came and knocked on your door and repaid back what I took from you? That was because of this guy. Right, that was because right, of this right, guy, man. Right. That was because of this Jesus was coming down the road. And this was the guy that was there. And what about Jarius' daughter, who was dead, amen? But now you find that she had life. And she was probably in the crowd. And she said, I was dead, but now I'm alive. I didn't even know about it. And somebody worked in my situation. And, it was, and man, the crowd's just building. Come on, I'm telling you, all this stuff began to come out about who he was. Lazarus and Mary and Martha were probably standing in the crowd that day. And I'm telling you, they were going excited. There was a group of people that was ecstatic. But I believe that not only whenever he was in that crowd of the smiling faces, there were probably those that were looking with frowns when you read in the scripture. Yes, right. Because the Pharisees, the Pharisees wouldn't have it. Right. We're supposed to be the, the top notch in here. We're supposed to be the upper echelon of what this guy's doing. Is messing up all this stuff, making us look bad. All this stuff making us look bad. He, he going around doing this healing, just taking money out of our, our little contribution pots and doing all this stuff. We, they were paying for healings and doing all this stuff. And, and there were people all around that got upset. It's crazy to think, isn't it? To think that God's moving and stuff, but there are people that are upset about it. Amen. But this happened with Jesus. Amen. We're going to talk about this in just a second. Need a drink. So who else were the people that were upset about it? We find that the other... The other kings, and that this, this was right around the feast of the Passover. You find the feast that was there, all the people were in town. Foreigners alike, there was a lot of people, but all the dignitaries would be in town. So all the Roman soldiers, they had their duty. The king would come right in, the Roman soldiers would be there. But now here comes a man that says that he's the king of the Jews. And the Roman soldier says, uh-uh, we have one king around here and you're not it. Right. The Roman soldiers saying, wait a minute, here's a troublemaker. This is the guy that's trying to up, hey, they're trying to do their job, protect their king. Now, who are you? In those days, if you could take the king out, you could possibly become the king, amen? In those days, there was a there was a certain process that people would war. They would try to bring, but the, the Roman soldiers are saying, wait a minute, this guy says he's king. And, and, and so inside of them, they're beginning to rage, rage begin to build. Right. They hear, now, on one side, people are rejoicing. On the other side, people are, are tearing it down. People are, are getting mad about exactly what's going on. But we see that Judah, that Jesus continued marching on. Jesus knew everything that was going to happen just over the next hill. Yeah. Right. He knew everything that would happen in Mount Calvary, but yet because of you and I, he continued to walk down that road. He looked at the crowd and the multitude crying out, Hosanna, and he's laying down the palm prod. They're laying him down that, that as he walks along. And, and, and you see that as he was going along, there were probably the disciples that were excited. We know that Judas had, had, had a different heart. Judas probably could have been thinking to himself, wait a minute. You just thought, hey, wait a minute, this is finally my opportunity to become a big man. They're going to see this man that I've been following, you know, I've been sacrificing, but I've just been waiting, man. I couldn't wait for this opportunity, man, for him to really open some things up. And boy, it's finally people are going to recognize who I am for all the hard work I've been putting in, Brother Bear. And man, they're going to see this thing. And it's about, see, because a lot of people debated why he, remember, he tried to give back the 30 pieces of silver. Right. A lot of people speculate the reason why he betrayed was that Jesus would save himself from them in the, in, in the sense that he wanted and, and chop them up and they'd say, hey. And he'd say, see, I told you that's my king. You couldn't take him anyway. 
That's what people thought. Hey, can you guys cut those fans down? I see a lot of people getting cold, all right? Just cut them down in half or something. All right, anyway, so we see that here, here we got Judas in that same spot. Now Judas is probably excited, and, and he thought, man, I'm finally going to be famous. And then I can imagine you, you got you got Peter, that Peter, he wasn't doing it for anything to be proud, but he's like, oh, that's my king right there. You know, he walked in front of his hand on his sword. He's like, now you remember what happened in the garden? Come on, he had a friend use that sword. Right, right, right. He's walking along. Yeah, he's going along and said, hey, this is my boss right here. You don't worry about it. He wasn't doing it for that reason. But there was something he was proud about. He seen him walking along. There were probably other people that were in the exact same crowd that day. That they probably seen Peter. And that was, then you probably had Thomas in the background saying, oh, Lord, I don't know if this is good or not. <laughs> Remember doubting Thomas? Thomas said, oh, uh, okay, I know the miracles you did, bro, but I don't, think, I don't think this works out too smart. All right, here we go. This is what Thomas is probably thinking. You look around and, and Andrew, who had been working so feverishly, bringing one or two people to the Lord, just you find his little accounts of, I say little accounts, but individual accounts of working with people. Right, but he right, thought, wow, right. look at this multitude of men. If the ministry's finally taken off in the way that we think, Amen. all these people, wow, look at this. Man, they're man, you said this would happen. You said that, that the people would want this, and his mind was going in that way. Then you got on the other side, you got the two brothers. Remember, Mama once said, Jesus, would it be all right if my boy sit on the left of you and on the right of you? James and John thought, oh, here we go. This is our time where you are going to be sitting on the left hand and on the right hand of the Christ. Everything is building up. Here he is. He's marching into town. There's getting ready to be this king. They're getting ready to see who he is. Man, this is going to be good for us. And all these people were in the crowd that Jesus looked at. What did he see when he looked out there? See, something we don't pay a lot of attention to. But what does the palm really represent in the scripture? See, if you look back, there's counts in history where they would lay down the palm fraud to a, a, a whenever you would have a, a kind of a warlord that would ride into town, a victorious warlord, they would lay down those palm frauds. But what did the palm fraud, what was it, what was it significant of the palm? What was it, what, what did it really mean? There was three words that was associated with the palm fraud. You ready? The first thing was this, that it was wealth, was one of the first things that was associated whenever you would lay that down. Health. Wealth and prosperity are the three words that it meant. If somebody had a palm frog waiting before them, it meant here comes a season of health, wealth, and prosperity. This is this means that we got a warrior that's going to fight on our behalf. Our country's getting ready to turn around, amen, because the warlord would walk back in, and he's won victories, and he's won battles, and, and they would lay it down before them, amen. And then here's what else you see. They cried out. What word did they cry out? This crowd, what were they crying out to him? What was it? Oh, don't say it. Why? Now you got to yell it out. I'm sorry. Hosanna. 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 Come on. We can do this. One, two, three. Hosanna. 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 Hosanna.
Man, it's kind of like that on the freeway. Why in the world are we just stop at 10 o'clock at night out here, man? What's going on? Hey, bro, what's going on up there? We're and all of a sudden, they realize that it's Jesus stopped. They get to see him stop, kneeling down, perhaps, to the ground. Not shaking, just, not just like these cold. Probably shaking with convulsions in his body. See, you hear about him in the scripture being emotional. You see places, you see, see, you see Jesus getting emotional in the scripture. Where do you see? You see that over the poor and the hungry. He said he had compassion. Remember they were falling. He had compassion on them. You see the scripture where the sinners would pierce his heart. That it would be things that would draw into compassion, guys. It would, it would draw them to a place where he would weep over them. He would see them and he would weep over the, the sinners and the people that needed him. You would see that there would be the sick that he would have compassion on and move. But only two times in the scripture do you ever see where it says Jesus wept. He wept when Lazarus died. Why? Because they, he knew that if I give him back life. Now, come on, if I give him back life, then immediately it said the Pharisees begin to consider, say, wait a minute, how are we going to take him out? That was the first time he wept. He said, I know this is going to be a hurt, but I'm doing it to bring life into my people. The second time is whenever he stopped. Now, here they just went, they're over here shouting Hosanna, doing all this. They're all excited. But what did it say when you read on? Jesus, we come to this place right here. They, whenever Jesus was looking at why was Jesus crying, you asked today. See, Jesus was crying because they did not understand. Here's what it says. And whenever he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in the, this day, the kings which belonged unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the days shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and go compass around about thee, or compass thee around, and keep thee in, the, in every side. And they shall lay thee, even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. And he went into the temple. And you can read on. What was he saying? You missed what I was trying to do. He said you missed what I was trying to do. My whole purpose wasn't to come. And to kill everybody that's done you wrong. Right, right. My purpose was that I could come into any situation. And no matter what you're facing. You can have peace in your heart. Not because I'm going to destroy your enemies. But because I'm going to give you strength to get through your trial. Because I'm going to give you what it takes to make it in the situation. Jesus said, all you want is a warlord to deliver you. But what I'm here to tell you is I'm going to fight the battle. But inside of you, see, I want to change something inside of you. Amen. They, listen, I want to tell you that Jesus was coming into the city. He was coming. In. The reason he came was that we could be set free, church. Sometimes we're wanting God to change every situation around us, but we don't want him touching our life. Amen. And on Palm Sunday, Jesus wept. Because he realized that the people had missed it. All they had ever wanted was somebody just to fight for them. And God says, I'm not here just to fight for you. I'm here to love you. Right. I'm here to give you something that the enemy can't take from you. You know freedom. Our freedom in this life can be taken. And while they can put handcuffs on you and throw you in a jail cell. But they can't stop this freedom in here. Right. Jesus said all they're doing is setting you free from the flesh in this life. What I'm telling you today is the palms. What did Jesus see whenever he seen it? Oh, yeah, Lord. We want health, wealth, and prosperity. We'll do anything. Oh, you're my king. <laughs> oh, yeah. And Jesus wept, said, because he realized all they were after was their betterment in this life. And he said, I've come to give you a life far beyond. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Yes. I've come to give you a life far beyond. He stops everything in, in verse 41. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in these last days, the things which, which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. Why? He said, because I knew that you weren't going to see it. They wanted, to, they wanted to war. They wanted to see bloodshed. They wanted to see a king that was going to come in and set them free. Right. They didn't get that. They got to see something they had never seen before. Turn to Matthew 5 and 43. What do we know when we talk about the Roman soldiers? We always teach the kids when they're doing some kind of a... Uh, doing something with an Easter play or they're doing something and talking about that. We talk about the life and the death of Jesus. We hear about the Roman soldiers. What was it, Brother Jerry? They're always nasty mean, right? Roman soldiers are always nasty mean. If you hear about the Roman Empire, they were very powerful, Brother Terrence. They were, man, they were, they were strong. They didn't take no mess off anybody. They were ready to fight. You want to fight? We'll fight. Come on. They, they, they come, come on. They, you know, they, they grew up on the other side of the tracks. Wherever that is in your mind, that's where they grew up from. They were on the other side of the tracks. They weren't taking no mess. That's just the way they were. They were rough. That's the way they were brought up. But here's what he says. Ye have heard it said that it hath, that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. 
Verse 44, but I say unto thee, love your enemies and bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Verse 45, and that ye may be able, uh, be, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his, his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Amen. Here's what was going on. The Lord has spoken this, this to them back in Matthew chapter 5. Now we're getting at the end of the story here. He thought, oh, yeah, I understand that. Uh, yeah, I understand we're supposed to love people. But what he was saying is you need to love the Romans who are whipping you. You need to love the people that are there. You know what they're trained in? They're trained in war. When somebody from the world or somebody's got a wrong spirit attacks you, they want a street fight. Right, right. Amen. So you can't fight love. This is what Jesus was teaching them on that day. And every time they threw out all this stuff that he was a war hero. Come on, ride in. That was conquered because he was saying, I'm coming in as a king in peace. Why don't you come ride in in the stallion? Come on, Lord. You, you've got almighty power. We've seen what you did. You can do it. Right. He said, but you don't understand. That the strength that I give you is the strength to hold on in the middle of the storm and not fight back. Right. right. That's good, Pastor. That's good. Maybe, maybe you're not there. I've been there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Been there. Been there. Come on, what is it? Sometimes we're praying so hard that God would change a situation. What is it that God wants to change in you? See, you're wanting, you're wanting to get even with somebody. God serve them. I, I, come on, I'm try, I pray that sometimes, Lord, just let it happen. Take them out, Lord. Yeah, let it happen. Come on, let, let it fall down. And God said, no, 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 you don't understand. You don't have my heart. Remember that? He told them, you don't know which spirit you're of because you're wanting to take these people out. God says, wait a minute, the spirit I want to give is one that will love. For the sake of love, we'll die for them. We'll hurt for them. We'll go through persecution for them. See, we, we, we don't like to think of that. We don't want to. We don't like to think of that, that that's what God wants. But God says, I want you to do something for the, the Roman soldiers and the Roman people that they've never seen before. They've never seen love. They've seen right. more. They ain't afraid. They'll take you out in a quick minute. Right. But they've never seen anybody that loved them so much and said, hey, if that's what you got to do, then you do it. What am I speaking to you right now about a situation you're in? Why are you praying that thing against them? Can you pray? I know this hurts, but God give me strength if it's for the sake of their soul. Can I go through that? For the sake of a soul, God, can you just give me strength to get through this battle? Right. God, for their purpose, oh, we talk about Palm Sunday, and sometimes we want to come at it with such exuberance and celebration, and there's no, our God has done all them things. But he stopped and wept, and he said, because they're missing the whole point of it. Today, I want you to be comfortable. What I'm speaking to you today in your situation, God is wanting you, come on, I want you to hear this, God is wanting you to have peace. He doesn't intend to remove every enemy. That's all going to come in the, in the destruction of the world. Come on, we know that. We understand. Armageddon, we, we've heard this. People don't like to talk about it. Some love talking about it. Amen. Either way, we know that that's going to come. What is that battle for? If we go out and think, I mean, I know there's plenty of evil to go around, but if we go out and knock it out, God ain't going to have nothing to do on that thing, right? No, no, no. God's already got it all under The thing is this. is a willing to lay down and be a sacrifice for lives. Amen. This is what he had in mind. This is what, what he's seen that day. He seen a group of people that just wanted somebody to deliver them out, but didn't want to really show that example. Today I'm talking about digging down deep. God will set you free, but your freedom will come inside. The freedom, you know where our greatest battle spot? Right here. Why does it talk about pulling down stronghold? But whenever it goes through, it talks about our spiritual world, it's in the battlefield of the mind. Right. Today, come on, how many could be willing to say, you know what, I need to be set free of some things in my mind? Amen. Come on, those I've shared with in the battles that I face in my mind, God, let me be set free. In my mind, the beauty of today is this, is that we know that Jesus Christ did go to that grave. Sister Paula, thank you for that beautiful song. He's risen. You know what that tells me? Now listen, that no matter what our enemies on this side can do, come on, they can't stop what's on the inside. Amen. Right, right. That's where we're set free in the same resurrection power that was in him. Amen. Jesus knew that they would not see that type of spirit again. That, we understand that. We read that. Here's what he said in Matthew 23 and verse 37. This is what the Lord's plan was that he spoke to the people. He wanted to deliver them. And I want us to hear this and put our own thought into this, our own mind. What happens if this was over us? The Lord spoke this in Matthew 23 and 37. Another account of this. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chicks under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Amen. What was he saying in this spot? So often I wanted to pull you in and give you peace. 
but you wouldn't accept me because I wasn't the king that you wanted me to be. Mm. In one week, they went from crying Hosanna as a praise and laying down these things. And, and really what it was saying, we, we need something from you to be in a place that they're ready to crucify. One week. Wow. One week. How easily we get offended at God when he doesn't work the way that we want. Right, we would right, all admit right, there's right. times. <laughs> if we would all admit that there's times that we're mad at God because he didn't answer our prayers the way that we want. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. There's times that we would probably, in the exact same, if we would have been standing in that crowd, Brother Ron, we might be the one crying out crucified. Mm -hmm. yeah. What I'm talking yeah. about today is this thing of, 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 mm -hmm. of the beauty of it. I'm talking about what Christ intends to give you. Right. You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about a peace that says even if there's a knife at your throat, you can be at peace. Right. Come on, if there's a mountain standing before you, right. you can speak to it, Sister Stanley. Right. I'm talking about situations that come at you that God says, I want to give you peace in it. How quickly our view can change when God doesn't do what we want to do. I want to ask you guys this as I close. How many would agree that Jesus' life is blessed? Amen. Amen. If you agree with that, you can raise your hand. Amen. All right, I got a few that didn't agree with me. That's all right. Michael agrees with me. Taylor, you don't agree with me? Okay, they okay. okay. All right, good. All right. We understand that he was blessed. Let me ask you about on the cross. Was he still blessed? Was he still blessed? Yes. Now, let me ask you why is it that in this life we can't see blessing and suffering together? It's all right. It's just a chair. We'll get it. Can I ask you guys why is it in this life? That when we look, we can't see blessing and suffering in the same sentence. Could it possibly be that your life is still blessed, but yet you're still suffering? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah, that's good, yeah. That's good. Yeah. That's good. No. Could it possibly be that God's heard every prayer that you cried? He says you're still blessed, and I'm working the purpose of what you're going through. Right. right. This is what the palm fraud, whenever they laid it down, he said, "No, you're missing it. This is not about this thing. This is about a life that's to come." This is about people's lives being touched beyond here. This is about something beyond this place. We don't see blessings and sufferings together. We don't see it that it can work together. Here's what sometimes we get caught with. I want you to hear this. It's more great. I, want you guys, I want you to hear this. I want you guys to hear this all across this place. Sometimes we think because we're going through suffering and persecution... Well, you're going through it, Brother Barrett. Oh, yeah, I'm blessed. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Barrett. I see everything you're going through. Man, you're just saying that all the time. You just say that so quickly. Oh, no, I'm blessed. Man, don't you see everything going on around you? Sometimes in our mind, we're like, well, I don't want to be the hypocrite. This goes along saying I'm blessed. I see everything going on. You ready? Here's what I want you to see. This was, this was a quote that one man said, and it blew my mind when I read it. He said this, you're not a hypocrite because you say you're blessed. In the middle of a, of a trial, you become a hypocrite when you won't say that you're blessed in the middle of a bad situation. Mm. All right. All right. If you stop saying you're blessed because the sky is falling, that's what makes us a hypocrite. So you got to understand your sky falling is part of being what God wants you to be. If you say, I must have done something wrong because I'm facing all, that's when we step across the line. Only when you can suffer and realize that it's all part of God's plan to set us free. We're celebrating new life. But before the new life can ever come, there's got to be the death. Right. Come on, we're talking about it. Next Sunday, he's resurrected. There's new life. There's Easter bunnies all over the place. Eggs, new life, new beginning. But new beginnings only come when we're allowed to die out that seed. He said, unless a corn of wheat falls to the ground and dies out, there will be no new life. Maybe you're suffering right now. Maybe you're persecuted right now. But I'm telling you, there's new life on the other side of this battle. There's new life on the other side of this trial. There's new life on the other side of this situation. Does that mean your persecution goes away? No. But what it means is this, is that God will be with you, be your strength. Three things we have to see that bring us out of this. Jesus prayed in the garden. Everybody say prayer. 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 What was his prayer? He had this real deep, super spiritual prayer that man, it was like, uh, he said, Lord, let this cup pass from me. In the garden, he prayed, Lord, let, the first thing he prayed, Lord, let this cup pass from me. Have you ever been in a spot where you're saying, God, just let this go away? Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. Pastor. You're in good company. You know, that's exactly what Jesus said. Come on, you're a good company today. That's exactly what Jesus said. Sometimes we look down on ourselves because we don't want to be in a situation. It doesn't mean it's comfortable. 
Right. What it means is that you're still blessed. Come on, Mary found favor, so she had to carry this child and face all the ridicule because she was blessed because her life right. was special. See, sometimes we're, just, we're praying that, and the enemy wants to trick us to say, no, no, and something's wrong with you. Lord, I just wish this cup could pass. Come on, I'm ready for this storm to be over. Can we say that? I'm ready for this storm to be over. Lord, I'm ready for this storm to be over. The second thing was this. We read where Jesus cried out, Lord, God, why have thou forsaken me? That's one of the most puzzling scriptures in the scripture. People would say, what are you talking about? I believe the very reason why is because at that moment, I believe that's when the weight of the sins of mankind was placed upon the shoulder to feel such pain and agony and he cry out, why have said And I want to tell you that pain and that weight, that sorrow that you felt, that's what he was saying at that very moment. Look, it, it feels like we're forsaken, but you got to understand it. In order that we carry that weight, that we carry, is why that we can tie out to that. Amen? The most important part of that, we understand Easter, but without the, without the death, there's no resurrection. Right. And in your life, you may be saying, why have you forsaken me, Lord? Lord, why have you forsaken me? Why have I dealt with this for all these years? God, why do I deal with this tonight? Why can't I just have a peaceful life? Why can't I just have a peaceful home? God, why can't my job just work this way? God, why can't this happen? But you got to understand, when we let go and say, Lord, but if that's your will, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will. Well, on every head bowed, every eye closed in this place. Not my will, Lord, but your will be done. And the third part of it all comes to this. We understand the prayer. We understand the death. But the very last thing is what we're going to talk about. Even, and I believe by next Sunday, I believe there's going to be great rejoicing. And that's the resurrection. Something has to be dead in order for it to be re resurrected. Before God can resurrect things, there's got to be a death in it. There's got to be a dying out. We always pray for revival. People say, bring us revival, bring us revival. But revival comes when something's dead. First thing we have to admit, there's some things that are dead that I need to let God revive. There's some things that I need to let God bring back to life. But so many times we beat it, we won't be honest. Oh no, it's all right. But not until we come to the place that we have to face the death in it. Yeah, something's not right. Something's not good. My way hasn't worked. I've tried it all this time. God, I, and it hasn't happened. Lord, I, I surrender it to you. Today, no matter how you feel about your situation, whether you feel good about it or bad about it, I'm telling you, to, and I've been, I'm speaking as a pastor to you today, surrender that to the Lord. It's all right to say, Lord, let this come past for me. Come on, don't let the devil beat you up. The Lord said this. Come on, let, let this come back to me in the spot. And then Jesus went back three times and prayed the same prayer in the garden. But in that spot, the Spirit overrides humanity and says, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Stephen, come on, started one of the greatest revivals in the New Testament. Because no longer did the church meet together. They were all in a big group, and then, and then they want to pull out Stephen, and they stoned him to death. So guess what they did? They started going in homes and having church. What happened? You find a great revival took place because of what happened in that time. And I'm speaking today that God's moving inside of that situation. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Let the dying out of your feelings, your emotions, your thoughts, and those things. Today, whenever we look at the palm, we see this beautiful scene. But the Lord says, wait a minute. Would this be a people that were looking to me to be a savior? Saving them in their heart, their mind? Or is it somebody that's come to me because they want prosperity? Is it somebody that's come to me because they want faith? Because they just want things better on this life. What happens if I told you today that God would make things right? That, that, that heaven would be your home if you would serve him? I can't promise you. I don't, I don't give salvation. That's between you and the Lord. What I'm saying, if you would serve God fully. What happens if I told you that today? That the Lord would take care of that, that heaven would be your home if you would serve him wholeheartedly, but that your house may be a wreck. That your finances, you may never seem like you have enough money to pay your bills. But yet heaven would be your home. Would you be willing to do that? See, the, you find that yeah, that's a tough thing. Peter said, they were sitting there, Peter and John, they said, silver and gold have I none. Such as I have, I give to thee. This is what they spoke to the beggar. Why? Because it wasn't, they were loaded with money. But he said, such as I have, I give to thee. And that's the spirit of God. Today, there's the Lord, Lord is saying, there's some things that I want to give you. He can take care of your finances. He's probably done in the past. That's just to show you how much he loves you. Now that you know that he loves you, are you willing to hold on and say, Lord, whatever you send my way, I'm going to walk in that path.
but today I'm asking across this place. You see every heart, every mind, got every thought in here, Lord. Hey God, I know that you're looking across this crowd today, Lord. I don't. I pray that you're not. That it's not a place to weep because we haven't understood it. Lord, I'm praying today, God, that, that Lord, that you don't look at us and see a fallen city, God, with the walls fall into rubble because they would not trust. Today, God, I don't need the things of this life. That God, the things of this life to make me happy, Lord, it's in your spirit, God. No matter what they stand before us, God, today, Lord, I promise that I stand before you to accept and know, God, that your will will be done. Lord, even if it doesn't look the way that I think it should look, God, even if I, you know, right, then it would, Lord, help me to die out to myself, Lord, and receive you in your fullness. Lord, today, God, I look to you and I say, I love you, Lord. Come on, all across this place, how many can just lift your hand towards heaven and say, I love you, Father. Come on, I love you, Lord. Lord, in this place, I need you to move. God, in this heart, this mind to mind. Lord, I'm not worried about the checkbook. God, I'm not worried of any of this other stuff today. God, this, this is a, this is a foreign object in our relationship. Lord, God, today what I'm praying is that in this situation, God, in my mind, my heart, that when I leave today, God, I can leave with the knowing the hope of the resurrection. That maybe there is death on this side, but Lord, it's a life on the other. Lord, maybe there's been death in the finances. And God, maybe there's been death, God, in, 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 in relationships. God, maybe there's been death, God, in my, my peace. God, that the enemy's trying to put there, but Lord, I know that it means life on the other side. Lord, and if this is the path today, God, I'll walk it with you. I'll walk it with you today, Lord. I'll walk it with you, Lord.